This is one of the least interesting looking laptops I've seen in my entire life. And a sentence like that is how you know you're watching Quick Start. More accurately, this is a Quick Start Gaiden. I'll explain that in a bit, but first, let's take a look at this crappy laptop. It's made by Averitech, a name you might have heard of, maybe. I mean, based on my comments, I suspect the majority of my audience is between 25 and 60 years old and largely nerds of one stripe or another, so statistically it's more likely than not, but Averitech only existed from 2003 to about 2010, and they were never a major name. Certainly during my two stints at computer recycling jobs, whenever I saw one, my reaction was, wow, that's some off-brand garbage. And this thing gives me the same feeling. I've remarked many times over the years that metallic silver paint was a harbinger of cheap crap in the early 2000s. I'm pretty sure the trend started in the late 90s when it signified luxury tier products from companies like Sony, but given that it was, after all, nothing more than a cheap coat of paint, it was very rapidly adopted by manufacturers of what I call born e-waste, stuff that's brought into the world for the sole purpose of making the shortest possible trip from injection mold to landfill, a practice we continue with even greater enthusiasm today, with AliExpress representing sort of a speedrun.com leaderboard for rapid fire wastefulness. So silver paint signified quality for a very brief period, but it still took over completely. Uh, crap, good stuff, didn't matter, everything got it. But I always felt like there was a particular sheen to the really cheap stuff. Like you could tell if something was landfill fodder even from a few feet away. And I'm certain that I first made this observation sometime around 2004, which happens to be the year this machine was first sold. This is an Averitech 6200 and it does in fact have the cheaper looking paint. There's not even a black or colored trim piece anywhere on it to distract from that. And on top of that, the general industrial design just screams mediocrity to my eyes. And that is definitely a good word for this thing. It's not horrible, it's actually better than average in a couple ways, but it's also not incredible by any means. The machine is 15.4 inches, the perfect size for a laptop. And its cons list is substantial. It weighs a good six pounds, uh, it makes a ton of noise when the fan is spinning, which it usually is. You'll be hearing that later, trust me. And it has very few ports. There's no serial, no parallel, nothing like that, uh, not to mention Firewire. It also has an anemic Athlon XPM CPU, an SIS741 graphics chip, which is basically unaccelerated, and a 4200 RPM hard drive. This is all pretty dire. Now on the pros, uh, it does have two USB ports on either side. It's got VGA and S-Video. It does have a card bus slot and it has a keyboard that actually takes advantage of the machine's size. I can't tell you how many 15 or 17 inch laptops were made with keyboards intended for 14 inch machines, which results in pointlessly cramped, miserable layouts with all this extra space on the side. This one on the other hand is big enough that it actually has both Windows keys and typing on this is actually pretty tolerable. I don't know if it comes across on the camera, but the speakers are both blown out. I don't know how this happens, but it's extremely funny. The screen is also decently bright. It's widescreen, which was not yet universal, and it has a 1280 by 800 resolution, which was pretty much the best you could ask for at this time, unless you got a really high-end machine. And finally, it has a DVD-ROM. Now, this wasn't a rarity at the time, to be clear. I mean, virtually every mid-range laptop had one of these, and this machine sold for $1,200, so that puts it in the mid-range. That makes the specs kind of curious, though. I mean, CNET's review outright said that as a laptop, it misses the mark in just about every way, citing the last-gen CPU, the worthless graphics, and the slow hard drive, but they said it in that curiously specific way as a laptop. And they said that because Averitech apparently marketed this as a laptop second and a DVD player first. And that's a very curious decision, but let's talk for a moment about what DVD players represented in 2004. Blu-ray and HD DVD wouldn't exist for another couple years. Very few people had even heard of HD and 480p was still the lingua franca of consumer video. So the DVD format was in full swing. On top of that, both LCDs and battery technology had become very mature. And as a result, every electronics company was pumping out portable DVD players. 
This was a practice that went on far longer than anyone could possibly have expected or desired. These things continue to clog up the used market to this day. I think almost every nerd who's ever trawled a yard sale or a thrift store has learned to hate them since we've all had our pulse quickened by the sight of what appeared to be a tiny laptop, only to find out it was yet another of these godforsaken things. Apparently, however, when the first ones came out circa 1998, they were plenty exciting. There were full page ads and breathless reviews in magazines. One Redditor I found says that at that time, their mind was blown by the thought of being able to watch a movie anywhere. No big deal now, but in 2004, a much bigger one. Nonetheless, even by that point, I'd already developed a distaste for the things, but that was for the simple reason that I was privileged enough to already have a laptop with a DVD drive. So if I wanted to watch a movie, I'd just do it on there on a much larger screen. So much bigger, in fact, that if I wanted to, I could open a web page or play a game at the same time, which I did frequently. So these things just felt like litter to me from the word go. But I should point out that I was also privileged to have access to electricity everywhere I went. My parents kept an inverter in the car before most people had them at all. And if we went camping, we got spots with hookups and so on. So it never really occurred to me to check how long my machine would have lasted on battery doing any of that stuff. In retrospect, I doubt I'd have ever gotten through a single feature film that way, but those portable DVD players could run four hours or more on a charge, and they were much easier to power off of a car or RV. Needless to say, those requirements remained relevant for a very long time, especially since not everyone could afford to drop $1,000 or more on a laptop with a DVD-ROM. The portable gadgets, on the other hand, cost $500 at the high end and were perfectly adequate for watching in a car or a tent. I also have no doubt they were a lot quieter. My laptop at the time, like most of them, made continuous screaming fan noise, which I chose to ignore because I was a nerd and didn't want to admit that my computer wasn't the solution to every problem. So portable DVD players definitely had value, but there was still one big problem. What if you needed a laptop also and didn't want to buy two devices? This was a theme in pre-2010s electronics. Prior to smartphones integrating everything into a single device, it was quite common for companies to build combined products that might seem kind of ridiculous in retrospect, but that made a lot more sense in their time and place. Apple's Tim Cook famously said that you can converge a toaster and a refrigerator, but it's probably not going to be pleasing to the user. That's pithy, but here's a much blunter take. If a toaster is $300 and a fridge is $1,000, but a toaster fridge is $1,100, that's gonna sell to anyone who wants both those things at a $200 discount. I'm gonna take advantage of this analogy to show off a device that's lingered in my studio for so long that I refuse to let it go another moment without being seen. This is a Kodak MVS, a camcorder system from about 1986. And I say that, but it's literally not true. There is no camcorder on your screen right now. This here is a video camera. That much is true. I could plug a cable into it and get a live image out of it, but it has no tape deck on the back, so you can't record with it. Thus, it's not a camcorder. And meanwhile, we've got this device here. This is a VCR, uh, though it's a bit on the small side because instead of using full-size VHS tapes like most, this uses Video 8. For comparison, this is VHS and this is Video 8. By the time Video 8 came out, VHS was pretty much universal. And there was a moment when it looked like it would actually replace VHS as a home video format, but it didn't because small size just wasn't terribly important for that application. But for camcorders, it was a lot more important because it let you make a much smaller unit than VHS would, obviously. And that's actually why this uses Video 8. Because if I press this button, the VCR portion pops off. And then we can take the camera here and just plug this into the back of it. And now it is a camcorder. The part that's left behind is the TV tuner and timer module. That stays in your entertainment center, plugged into your TV and your antenna and whatnot, while you take the VCR with you. You shoot video, you come home, and then without even ejecting the tape, you just take this off, dock it right back into the machine, press play, and instantly your video is up on the TV. Now, this seems very convenient, but it's also very weird. I mean, why not just have the tape deck built into the camera like we're used to? Well, the better question is, why was that ever the way we did it? If you're younger than 
I guess about 50 at this point, you might not realize that VCRs were phenomenally expensive devices in their heyday. Prior to the late 80s, they could cost the equivalent of three to $5,000 converting for inflation. And since camcorders had integrated recorders, they cost a fortune as well because you had to buy the whole VCR unit. Now, how does it make sense to pay nearly full price for a VCR to take out of the house when you've already paid for one that's just gonna sit at home and do nothing the whole time you're out? Why not just bring it with you? Kodak's device was a recognition of that fact, but it wasn't a new one. When home video started catching on in the late 70s, the earliest camera systems actually did send people out of the house with their home VCR in tow. People were toting around full-size decks made mostly of steel. They weighed over 20 pounds and plugged into their cameras with umbilical cables. So they'd record their kid's soccer game, then go home, plug the VCR back into the tuner timer module, just like this thing, and the next day would record a baseball game while they were at work. And doing this saved you the equivalent of $5,000. So it definitely made sense, even if it looked ridiculous and risked damaging your rotator cuffs. And you can see the same philosophy behind a lot of other 70s and 80s products. Portable stereos, for instance, they pretty much all had AC inlets. The portability is what we think of, and it was obviously an important feature, but if they couldn't also be used at home conveniently, then anyone who wasn't pretty loaded would have been forced to skip the portability in favor of one that would work well inside their house. But in the mid-2000s, the great convergence began. MP3 players collapsed all of our separate audio formats into one device, just as media center PCs did for VCRs, DVD players, and TV tuners. Everything was collapsing into the coming singularity, but it hadn't quite happened yet. And this Averitech laptop is the swan song for that era. This is a multimedia machine, not a media center, since that term wouldn't become well known for another couple of years, but it was definitely built around audio and video. The full model number, in fact, is AV6210. So it's natural that it would have a DVD player. Um, for some reason, this doesn't have any DVD software on it, but it also looks like the previous owner may have deleted a bunch of stuff, including some Windows components. So I think they probably deleted the Power DVD or Win DVD that came with it. But just to make the point, let's put a DVD in. And if we start up VLC, this is what it's been doing. But it gets there eventually. I don't know why it takes so long. It usually does this for a bit or something like it and then just starts working. Okay, good. This I wasn't sure if this disc had. Okay, the DVD drive just died. I'm surprised this doesn't happen more often, but I'm gonna have to go ahead and replace it before I can continue here. I'm gonna talk about this later, but this machine's actually eh, pretty decent to work on. Get the optical drive out, just take out these two screws. A little secret for you is that every single laptop optical drive ever made is actually the same. Uh, they're either IDE or they're SATA. And if you have an IDE drive, you can swap it with any other IDE drive. It may not look the same, on the back, but that's only because they have an adapter on there. Uh, this is from a Dell laptop. Let me just take this case off. This is the bare drive itself. And if we just pull this plate off, you'll see these are absolutely identical underneath. So this will slot in there and work, but I just realized this is just a plain CD-ROM, not a DVD-ROM. So uh, I'm gonna have to run over to the store and pick up a DVD-ROM. I'll be right back. Okay. That took a bit and a few drives, but all right, it's working now. We're finally playing a DVD. And of course, this isn't an unusual feature at all for the era, but the media controls on the front edge here were. The little LCD screen bordered by volume and playback controls looks pretty much just like what you'd see on a Discman or, you know, one of those portable DVD players. Now the LCD isn't doing much right now and the buttons work pretty much just like the ones you'd find above the keyboard on a lot of other media focused machines. Uh, so we can use them to control our DVD playback for instance. We can play pause and we can skip chapters or at least we could if VLC wasn't the worst DVD player in history. Pretty much everything you do just makes it skip back to the menu. This thing is terrible. But I'm sure it would work with a real DVD player program. And if we eject this disc, which we can do from the front panel here, which we can do from the front panel here, which we can do from the front panel here, come on, bud, and put in an audio CD. Then up pops Windows Media Player, and we can control playback. And we can adjust the volume. 
And since I've adjusted the power options so the machine doesn't go to sleep whenever it's plugged in, we can close the screen and all this continues to work. We can still control it with the screen closed. So this is nice, but several other multimedia machines had similar external controls like this. I'm not sure if I know any of the model numbers to show you, but I know I've seen it before from this era. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that at least one mid 90s laptop had these, like one of the first ones that had an optical drive. So in any case, this isn't unique. And it's also not fully functional. The uh, little screen isn't doing anything, which is kind of a bummer. And there's also a menu button here, and that doesn't seem to do what it suggests. You'd hope it would go to the DVD menu or something, but instead it just opens whatever the default media player app is. That's to say nothing of the on off button here, which does nothing whatsoever. So something is missing here. And if you've seen this series before, then you know what's coming. To see what makes this machine special, we have to turn it off. All right, the machine is completely powered down now, and I'm gonna turn it back on, but instead of using the power button above the keyboard, I'm gonna press this on-off button here on the front. Welcome to a Veritech DVD. Give that a couple of seconds. And there's our movie. You'll notice that the LCD on the front is now working. Uh, the main menu on a DVD is technically called the root menu, so this says root. And we'll find now that the keyboard and the mouse don't do anything. Uh, plus we don't have a complete set of controls on the front here, so we can't really interact with the menu. But if we hit the play button, the movie does start playing. And you can see the LCD here now tells us where we are in the chapter. And of course, all the controls we do have here work fine. So if we adjust the volume, uh, it not only works, but we have this nice on-screen display now. And we can play pause, uh, we can skip chapters, all that stuff. And of course, we can eject the disc, and I'm gonna do that now. And swap it for an audio CD. So it plays that too. And again, if we close the screen, it continues playing, and since the little LCD works properly now, we can actually see the time index, we can control this whole thing with it closed. And in fact, we can even turn this off. Okay, the machine is now completely turned off. And now if we hit the button, we can start it up and begin playing music without ever opening the screen. So essentially, we can use this just like a normal tabletop CD player. In fact, it even has an IR receiver over here, and that pairs with the tiny remote control that hides over here in the card bus slot. Now, I need you to take my word for this. This remote worked perfectly when I got the machine, and then something happened. I replaced the battery, and I accidentally used a CR2025 instead of a 2016, which is a slightly thicker cell. That shouldn't have damaged it, but ever since then, I haven't been able to get half the buttons to work. I think this is my fault, but maybe it's just crap. I don't know. But when I got it, uh, all these controls worked. So you could play, pause, adjust volume, and even turn the thing on and off from across the room. Let's see if that still works. If I squeeze the remote really hard, there we go. You can turn this on from across the room and use it just like a normal CD player and just completely ignore all of its PC functions. In addition, the D-pad here lets you access the DVD menus, and if I fiddle with that enough, I can sort of get it to work. So let's go back to the DVD here. All right, we can, with some effort, access the chapter select menu and pick a chapter. And as a bonus, this remote actually works in Windows too, although not nearly as well for some reason. I'm not sure how the IR receiver is integrated with Windows. I couldn't find a special utility for it or anything. It must have a driver, but the only thing I can get it to do is to play and pause the currently active media player and adjust the volume. Play, pause, and well, the volume's adjusting in Windows, but the previous owner somehow uninstalled the volume control utility, so I can't show you that. I, I didn't know that was possible, but they somehow did it. Like, I'm not joking, look at this. You ever seen this? Did you know you could uninstall the volume control program? This is like a new era of breaking a computer. I've never seen anything like it. 
So I'm gonna assume that if I had like power DVD on here, then probably all these controls would have worked. And assuming that's true, that means that this thing actually offered a pretty good media center style experience when it was new. I mean, I talked in the Toshiba Cosmio video about how cool it would have been to have that tank of a laptop in a cramped dorm room where you could use it instead of a TV since it had full remote control capability. So you didn't have to buy a TV and a laptop. See any parallels here? Now this predated that machine by like three or four years, maybe more, plus it's a lot smaller and easier to tote around. And while the remote is crappy and miserable, that's only because it has to be small enough to fit inside the machine, which you couldn't say for the Cosmio. Now this wasn't a unique idea, the card bus remote control, other machines did that, but not many, and I don't think very many in 2004. Now, at this point, you've seen every special feature this has. It literally does nothing more than just play CDs and DVDs. And really, none of that was even what we're here to see. What makes this machine interesting is just how long it takes to start, or rather, how long it does it. This is so quick, let's just do it again. From power on to reaching a splash screen takes about four seconds. And to actually play a DVD only takes 20, including the time it took to get to the splash screen. That's so fast that I didn't even have time to play the Quick Start theme music. So let's talk now about the Quick Start series and why this episode gets the asterisk next to its name. If you're new to this show, the premise is like this. Back in 2006, around when Windows Vista came out, computers began to take a really long time to boot. Now, part of that was because Windows Vista was much more bloated than XP, and part of it was because nobody had SSDs yet. But part of it was because PC vendors were loading down their machines with so much crapware that they took literally minutes to start up even if they had decent hardware, and that was making the computing experience much less pleasant, especially on laptops, where all that time spent starting up was eating up precious battery life. Or maybe none of that's true. It's actually becoming quite unclear as the series progresses whether this problem really existed outside of a tiny handful of extremely cheap and underspecked machines or standouts like Sony's VIO subcompact that was full of essentially vendor installed malware. And on top of that, standby functions had become pretty reliable at this point, so nobody really needed to shut their PC down all the way anymore. And PCs resumed from standby about as fast as Macs did, like 10 seconds tops. So. It seems like the whole problem was imaginary, but the vendors certainly thought it was real because they came up with tons of solutions. Or ra rather, they came up with one solution. Almost every machine that I've shown in this series can be condensed down to the same simple sentence. It dual boots Windows and Linux. Or, or in a couple cases, they just dual boot Windows and Windows. Basically, vendors couldn't figure out how to make Vista faster, but they could ship a second lighter weight OS alongside it, uh, such as a trimmed down copy of Linux, or in a couple cases, just Windows XP embedded. And then when the user hits a special power button, they boot into that instead of the normal OS, and it saves a little bit of startup time. And I mean, even the really outlandish, technically advanced examples, like Phoenix's Hyperspace, which did some unimaginable trickery with ACPI to allow it to suspend one OS and boot into another without actually restarting the machine, just used that cleverness to load a lightly modified copy of Linux. So as a result, none of these solutions seemed to really work all that well. They rarely booted much faster than the primary Windows install, if at all. They had very limited functionality for no obvious reason. And while a couple of them claimed to save on battery life, it doesn't seem like any of them actually did. So in short, they were utterly pointless and I'm pretty sure nobody ever used them. Nonetheless, I've come up with enough of these things to make a whole series about them with several more episodes still in the pipeline. I mean, there were a lot of these things for some reason, but this machine, in my opinion, isn't really part of all that. The Averitech certainly seems like it has the quick start premise. I mean, it does have two power buttons and the second one definitely starts the machine quicker than the first. To give you an idea, even though this thing is running Windows XP, from power on to playing a DVD, it takes over a minute and a half, and most of that is spent just booting the OS. Now, maybe that doesn't sound all that bad, but even for this era, it should be a lot faster than that. And if this didn't have a 4200 RPM hard drive, I'm sure it would be twice as fast. Now, one of the principles of quick start machines is to work around slow hard drives, and this is clearly doing that, so it certainly looks the part. And another principle that some quick start machines attempted and failed direly to achieve was to offer better battery life in their alternate operating mode. This tries that too, but it actually pulls it off with flying colors. 
When I tested DVD playback under Windows, the average power consumption was 45 to 50 watts. And given the 65 watt hour battery, you'd be lucky to get an hour and 10 minutes out of this. You couldn't even make it through a single feature length film. But in DVD player mode, this only pulls 14 to 18 watts. That's about four plus hours, which brings it neck and neck with an off the shelf portable DVD player. So this is actually a good working worthwhile feature. And the comedy option is to say that disqualifies it from the series all on its own because, to be honest, all the other machines I've covered or will cover are trash. Except for maybe the Toshiba Cosmio. That was pretty cool, I gotta admit. But that's not really the core issue. The real problem is that this series is about PCs that boot two different operating systems, and this doesn't do that. You see, when we started up in DVD player mode, the machine was not powered on. Let me make that point. I mentioned earlier this machine was pretty nice to work on. Let me show you what I mean. So under this cover, you've got the hard drive, and then under this one, you've got everything else. That's the uh, mini PCI Wi-Fi, you've got your memory, and then you actually have your CPU right there. And now I'm gonna take that CPU out. That's our Athlon XP Mobile. And we just pop the PGA socket here. There's our chip. And let's go ahead and turn it back on. Put Jackie Chan back in. And there we go. Our DVD is playing with the CPU laying here on the desk. This machine is completely and fully lobotomized, but it still works. How is that possible? <laughs> well, if you've watched this series to date, you might remember the extremely expensive Dell machine that did something similar by using a second computer, literally a complete system on a module with an ARM-based SOC that takes over the motherboard like an alien brain slug. When you powered up in latitude on mode, the module took control of the keyboard, the mouse, and the monitor, and then launched a heavily reduced copy of Linux. Since it was running on a single core ARM chip at a few hundred megahertz, instead of a full power 1.4 gigahertz core two duo, this obviously saved quite a lot of power. I mean, they literally shipped a lower power computer that's just inside your normal computer. So naturally this worked. The problem was that processor was so low powered that it couldn't actually load any useful programs and run them with any sort of speed. It took longer than Vista did to boot and everything was uselessly slow. And sure enough, the other machines we've seen, even the ones that had quick start DVD player modes where that's all they could do, still took about 30 seconds to boot. This, on the other hand, only takes about 10, and the reason for that will shock and probably disappoint you. In short, it's not really booting anything. To figure out how this does its magic, I took the machine completely to pieces. That was kind of miserable, but that's just because it's working on a laptop, right? I mean, this isn't nearly as nice to work on as a contemporary Dell Latitude, so if you've noticed any uh, gaps between the panels, that's because I had eight screws left over when I was done, no idea where they go, and I nearly destroyed it in the process, so I'm not gonna take it apart again for the camera, but I did get some pictures. Mostly, I found normal PC components, RAM, EEPROMs, a video chip, BIOS chips, that sort of stuff, all very normal except for one part, and I'll bet it's not one you've seen before. That is an ESS video drive. Now, you might know the name ESS Audio Drive. That was a series of low-cost sound chips that shipped on a bunch of motherboards and sound cards, particularly the later lower-cost sound blasters. They're not terribly well regarded as far as I know, and eventually they just fell off the map, but apparently ESS went on to make stuff like this. And what this is, is a single chip DVD player solution. And with just that factoid, you can probably see how the chips fell, right? P pun intended. The device this is meant to emulate is the silver paint portable DVD player from Kobe that disappoints you when you find it at the Goodwill. And Averitech did that by including the exact same chip that you'd find in a silver paint portable DVD player by Kobe. Chips like this are sold to companies that don't really have a ton of electrical engineering skill. They can maybe fabricate a simple two-sided PCB, source some common parts like an LCD display and driver chip, solder it all together and make a plastic case to put it in, but that's it. They can't design any circuitry from scratch and or they don't want to. So the chip does literally 
everything. It talks directly to an IDE CD-ROM or to flash memory cards if you want. It outputs analog video in multiple formats. It has an on-screen display, an IR remote interface, digital audio output, and internal decoding for MPEG, MPEG-2, MP3, Dolby Digital, and all sorts of other formats. Hell, this thing plays karaoke discs, okay? It's everything you'd ever want from a disc player at that point in time finished, ready to use. As the OEM, you just stick it on a board next to some RAM chips, wire it up to an IDE drive, an LCD display, and some output jacks, and you're done. It's a fiendishly complex device with hundreds of hours of engineering behind it that's susceptibly simple and easy to use. In fact, it's so fully integrated that if you hit the menu button on the remote, you get an OSD with the exact kind of hideous low-res iconography you'd expect from a set-top box. Here you can enable captions, adjust the PCM format for a digital audio output that doesn't actually exist, and even adjust the color balance. I'm sure there were a half dozen other menus in here that were all disabled at the factory, but ESS didn't think to offer settings to get rid of those ones. So in essence, this is basically a normal set-top consumer DVD player that's just plugged in to our laptop screen and speakers. I mean, it even has the DVD screensaver. And yes, it will eventually hit the corner. Oh, that was it, yes! And that's pretty much the size of it. A Veritech made a laptop that duplicates the functionality and efficiency of a DVD player by just including a whole DVD player in addition to the laptop. But that means that when it's in DVD mode, it isn't really a PC anymore. And that's why I called this episode a side story. Quick Start is about PCs with two modes of operation, but this is just a PC with a passenger that they let drive sometimes. And your guess is as good as mine as to how that was accomplished. I wasn't able to fully reverse engineer this thing because I'm not an electrical engineer, but even if I was, I can't see all the layers to the motherboard. I can't see how everything's plugged together. So all I can say is that I didn't see any of the parts I was expecting. See, much like Dell's Latitude On solution, when you power up in DVD player mode, the player I see is clearly taking over the LCD display, the speakers, the IR receiver, the front panel controls, and the optical drive, but how does it do that? I mean, those things are all connected to the IO on the PC side of things, and I really doubt that they just wired every peripheral to both the PC and DVD chips, because that generally doesn't work. Uh, consider, for instance, the ESS chip might have its own audio amp that they could plug into the laptop speakers in parallel with the PC, but that would mean driving amplified audio into the output of the PC sound hardware. That's bad for plenty of reasons. And I'm pretty sure you can't just plug two host controllers into one IDE drive because even if one of them is powered off, it's still gonna sync voltage from the bus lines and throw off all your logic levels or cause signal reflections. Or even worse, the PC's host controller might pick up power from the DVD player and start trying to talk to the drive. I mean, there's just so many ways that this can go wrong. So I expected to see a bunch of digital switch or MUX chips scattered around the board, uh, like I did in Alienware's laptop in the last Guide N episode that had the switchable HDMI input. Now this being a gaming laptop, it of course has two graphics adapters. That's very common. There's a chip called a MUX. The output of that MUX then goes into another MUX but I found nothing of the sort. This is easily explained, however, if a Veritech did it all piecemeal. All you really need to do is put some MOSFETs in there that are powered off a logic level from the PC side of the machine so that when the PC's off, a number of key signals and power rails for all those shared peripherals get switched over to the DVD side of the thing, isolating them from the PC. And I'm guessing that's what they did, I just don't have the chops to prove it. I would also guess, however, that it's why most of the PC's ports don't work. You can't play video from a USB drive, even though the video drive chip supported that, and both the VGA and S-Video ports are inactive. Now, the VGA isn't surprising, but the video drive chip has native S-Video output, so that's kind of wild. I really thought that would work. But we saw similar issues with Dell's Latitude On. None of the PC's ports worked in that mode, and it even had to include its own Wi-Fi controller because it would have taken an obscene amount of effort to interact with the one that the PC used. So I'm not surprised that the Veritech stopped short of making everything work in both modes. That would have bumped the price up even more to account for the extra parts in engineering, and I imagine these limitations wouldn't have bothered most consumers. So ultimately, this is an incredibly simple and effective idea. It is, in no uncertain terms, a DVD player and a laptop in one trench coat, as if you hooked up both devices through a KVM switch. And that makes this the consummate toaster fridge. It's two unrelated devices stuffed in one box simply to save the buyer a few bucks. And that's pretty much all I have to say about the machine itself. 
But something came up during research that I doubt I'll ever have a reason to talk about otherwise, so I figured I'd do it now. I said earlier that I always thought Averitech was a crappy low-end brand, but I'd never really looked into who they were, and I was really surprised by what I learned. Per the wiki page, they were a sub-brand of a South Korean company called Trigem, who I'd never heard of, but which apparently held significant cachet in the local Korean market in the 80s and 90s. In fact, they were ostensibly the largest laptop manufacturer in the country at one point. But when that market started to tank in the 90s, they decided to break into the US market by creating e-machines. Did you know e-machines was Korean? This is the first I've heard of it. See, I assumed they were a US startup because that was the heyday of American PC startups. HP Compaq were the corporate elephant dipping their toes into the pond, but all the other big names began as startups, Dell and Gateway being the biggest ones. They sort of covered the high-end and mid-range, respectively, and I just assumed that eMachines was another US startup that intended to fill in the really low end, the sub $500 systems. And they certainly did that. I mean, e-machines were the worst built computers I ever saw. When I was working in electronics recycling, every single one that came through had blown caps or other dead components. And that was somewhat common with early 2000s computers, to put it mildly, but listen to me, I'm saying that 100% of the e-machines I saw were dead. No exceptions, none of them would even power on, even if they were only two or three years old. But that isn't surprising once you realize that the company was founded by a near bankrupt corporation with the express intent of hitting the low end niche. Naturally, they bought the cheapest components they could find. So I was right that eMachines was founded to make cheap, trashy computers. I just didn't realize they weren't from the US or a startup. Now, eMachines was ostensibly a collaboration between Trigem and several other companies. And if the poorly sourced wiki page is to be believed, Averitech was also part of that partnership. So you'd figure they were founded with a similar budget and principles, buy low, sell even lower, but I'm not entirely sure that's true. Some sources suggest that Averitex were once sold under the name Sotech, a Japanese company and one of the other co-founders of eMachines. A fun fact for you actually, uh, Sotech was the original brand name on the eMachines E1, the iMac clone that famously caught a lawsuit from Apple. And it seems at a glance like maybe Sotech weren't totally focused on the low end. That E1 was pretty innovative, even if it was a ripoff, and this machine seems like it had some thought put into it. The specs aren't the best, but you know, it wasn't supposed to be a high-end machine, and for what it's worth, it's not that bad to work on by the standards of the time. It's got this big convenient access panel, and also it turns out it only has two sizes of screw in the entire machine, which is not a claim that Sony could make with their godforsaken Vios. And it also still works, uh, with the exception of the DVD drive and the remote, which I'm pretty sure I broke myself. 20 years later, everything else about this machine still functions. And of course, I'm pretty sure it's also the only laptop in existence with a built-in DVD player module, so you have to give them some credit. Although it's possible that Averitech, nay Sotech, had nothing to do with any of it. See, this motherboard is silkscreened with the name MicroStar, who we now know as MSI. They weren't a major player in US laptops at the time, but they were designing and building motherboards. So maybe Averitech was the ODM to MSI's OEM. They designed the machine, then had MSI build it. But usually when I see a label like this, it's by the company that actually did the design as well. So very possibly Averitech contributed nothing here other than maybe the idea of an integrated DVD player, or maybe they did nothing whatsoever except put a different name on one of MSI's Asian market machines as they were confirmed to be doing a few years later. I wouldn't be surprised to learn that Averitech really was just importing and rebranding machines from a company that wasn't quite ready to sell to the US market directly. On the other hand though, I haven't been able to come up with an MSI laptop that had this feature. It seems like it really is unique. So maybe it really was Averitech's idea and it's kind of a shame that it didn't become more popular. I think it makes a lot of sense. And besides super nerds like me, most people probably didn't want multitasking from their DVD players. It also would have been pretty damn cool if we'd gotten some laptops a couple years later with built-in Blu-ray chips that could run for four hours on a charge. But sadly, I think this was the only time this was ever attempted. And that's it for this episode of Quick Start. Guy Dan. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, you might want to check out the whole series. There's a, about six or eight other episodes at this point. I'll link a playlist in the description. And like I said, there are more episodes coming. You can't imagine how many of these things got built. So if you want to find out when those got released, make sure you subscribe and maybe turn on notifications if you want the slimmest possible chance of YouTube actually telling you when they get released instead of just maybe trickling them onto your front page. But if you really had a good time, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are doing. 
This is my full-time job for some reason. I don't know how that happened, but apparently people like seeing these horrible little computers and I just keep finding them. But I couldn't afford to keep buying them without their support. I also couldn't buy groceries or gas for my car or pay the rent on my studio. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of my patrons for making this possible. I can't thank you all enough. And everyone else, thanks for watching.